good afternoon. I'm Michael Young and I run Accenture Software Engineering Business and I'm so pleased to be joined today by Mark Porter who is the CTO of MongoDB. Mark, let's talk about microservices. Let's talk about how they're the same, how they're different, and why should I care? That sounds exciting. Let's get going. For decades now, uh, companies and IT shops have been trying to build stuff in modular ways, right? And so the modular way of doing I mean, that's things... that's nothing new. It's not anything new. Functional decomposition and even on the mainframe, right? You could have well-structured uh, COBOL programs with picks on top of them, etc. Right. Then there was the object-oriented revolution, right? In the early 90s, as you know, small talk is my yep. favorite, my favorite <laughs> programming language. Uh, and everybody was trying to build stuff in objects, right? That kind of mm -hmm. modeled the real world. People would talk about service orders and purchase orders and products. And look, you could see it in the software. Then we had SOA, right? Service-oriented architectures, which is objects, maybe a bit larger grain with APIs on top of them and all that. So now along comes microservices. And I, I talk with a lot of chief architects and engineers who are like, I I've heard all this before. We understand all that modular stuff, and it, it didn't exactly work out as we had hoped, right, in the 90s or the 2000s. How are microservices really different? So I think it's really interesting because, like you say, I mean, it's not like modular, modularization is anything new. And to pretend it was would be silly. So what we see is that the technologies have come along that you can actually implement sure a lot better. And so what we see people doing is they'll take an island of data. And that might be multiple databases, and they'll put some number of services. I'm not really, you know, some people joke about nano services, which is like one <laughs> API on top of one collection or one table. That's silly. I don't think That's anyone right. does that. Too many because things to manage in a production the, the, environment. The operational burden of that is too much. Now, on the other hand, you have a database with 50,000 tables that when it goes down, the company goes down. That's right. And so you can't have that. So microservices are going to be different for every company, and they're going to be on that spectrum. But the spectrum that's really good is one where you have 40 or 50 people, you have three or four teams, they're working on one or two or three databases, and they have some APIs, maybe 50 or 60 APIs. I'm really putting concrete numbers on those so our listeners can actually kind of walk away and it's not that theoretical. How, how big is a microservice? Yeah, how yeah. big is a microservice? Because you don't want a nano service and you don't want a monolith. And so what we found is that people work really well in groups like that. And so the API protection lets people innovate. And so, you know, a little plug for MongoDB, yeah, yeah, yeah. we actually have this flexible document model and the ability to scale up and the ability to scale down. And where it really shines is inside behind an API where that team can scale down their database or scale up their database or change their schema or do anything they want, and yet they persist the API. So a microservice is a way of encapsulating in the computer software the way the humans at the company are working together. And so you get this group of people and this group of people and this group of people. And you hit the nail so on the head when you said people are own and are responsible for their own data, right. not just their own logic. The problem with monoliths in the past was people were responsible for their own logic, but it was shared responsibility shared for database. the data. That's exactly right. And so you said something that I thought was very interesting, Mark. You said people like working in that way when you talked about sort of the microservices mm -hmm. and these protected APIs. And I think when we talk about how big is a microservice, a microservice is big enough that a two pizza team, uh -huh. right, an agile team can take care of it. And of course, we use the phrase two pizza to refer to the team should be no larger than can be fed by two pizzas. So that's typically eight people. So you now have these eight people teams, right, these these agile teams that have responsibilities, you say, not just for the application logic, but also entire responsibility for the database underneath that. Right. And it's a very new way of working. But when you work like that, it makes it so easy for you to quickly innovate, to create new new products and release them. You know, you think about Netflix is famous for having lots of microservices and having a microservices architecture and fabric. And there's a lot of stuff that you can Google about, well, how, how did Netflix do it? But Netflix is releasing right new features using A-B testing all the time to their interface. And they're able to do that because they have these small teams that are responsible for their own data. And they don't have to worry about talking to the enterprise DBA and plugging in appropriately and not screwing up the large relational database. They're in charge of their own data, just like they're in charge of their own business logic. Yeah, let me give you an example. That's exactly right. I went to a company, um, it was a ride sharing company. I was CTO there. And I went to the company and we were doing about 40 to 50 releases a week. 40 and, to 50. And across a very large team. That's so that wasn't fast, actually. No, it was actually slow. Ah. Um, many, many teams only doing 40 or 50 releases a week. Software was going out too slow. Many teams weren't releasing except on quarter boundaries. 
And the problem Got is it. when you release on a quarter boundary, you forgot what you did. And so when there's a bug in the deployment, everyone has to page it back in. It's terrible. That's right. So over the next two years, uh, my team, I mean, I was just the CTO. They did all the work. My team was actually able to break down into microservices. We got to over 400 microservices running on top there of over 100 databases. And we got up to over 1,000 deployments a week. Some teams were deploying every two days. And so that meant that the code that was going to production was the code they just finished testing. It was fresh, fresh in the mind. feature velocity was faster, employee morale was higher, and it was all because we modularized the people, the organization, and the software using the same units. And that's what microservices is about to me. It's about having that tie between all those things. And I bet you those teams, of course, had the technology discipline and the automation and the CICD and shifting left and all that stuff to be able to innovate and move quickly, right? Well, to be honest, none of this is easy, right? We've talked about that <laughs> in our other series. To be honest, actually, we kind of had a really hard time. We started down this path and we kept having outages. We kept having deployment problems. So we slowed down a little bit to go fast and we got our deployment methodology right. And it was called the 180 rule which is when you deploy software, it should take less than 60 seconds to deploy, less than 60 seconds for the computer to determine whether the deployment was successful, not, yeah. and less than 60 seconds to roll it back. And once we had that in place, we were, people were able to felt safer deploying software. That's the other thing about microservices. No one feels safe deploying to a monolith. The side yeah. effects of what they deploy could take down the company. If you did something over here, you break something right. over there. But when you have a microservice, it's you and the people you work with it's every day, you. and you can roll it right back. That's right. So we had to slow down to go fast. Yeah, I think about uh, innovating with microservices and small databases. Reminds me during the pandemic of some very important work we did with one of our clients to get shots in arms. So this is a, a provider that uh, was providing shots and vaccines and already had a scheduling system for vaccine management, but they weren't able to uh, get all the requirements right from the FDA uh, into the system quickly enough to be able to get the shots out, so decided to create a new system to do that. And of course, we did it with microservices in the cloud using MongoDB and was very quickly able to create this new system so that people could go in and get the shots that they needed during the pandemic. That's the type of innovation that comes when you have these small two pizza teams with the automation, agile ways of working, and the, and the technology and modern engineering architecture to support it. And what's so interesting about that example is it wasn't like there was some quarter or some earnings release that was driving you. It was people's health and That's it was exactly urgent. Right. And it saving had to lives. Have, it, right. Yeah. So, it, so the, the urgency of getting the software out was actually about saving lives, not about profit or not about meeting some deadline. It was actually about saving lives. That's really exciting.